Hi, and welcome to the American Ghost Walks live, sc- live stream. It is Tuesday, October 19th, and we're talking uh, to uh, Greg Lawson, the paranormal detective, about his brand new book that's coming out uh, about Roswell. As you can see, I'm in space right here, um, and then uh, Greg's going to join us uh, to talk about that. Jumping in, Mr. Greg Lawson. Uh, the paranormal detective uh, talking to us. Greg, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, and you are in? I am in Georgetown, Texas, just north of Austin. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, I'm not in space. I wish I was in space. Right. It's, well, I tell you what, it's it's pretty nice out here. Um, it's it's a little chilly, and yeah. you have to duck a lot. Uh, that's right here. Uh, but other than, that, <laughs> other than that, it's great. Uh, so, Greg, uh, for people who might be unfamiliar with your work or maybe haven't seen you before, uh, can you give us a little bit of your background? Sure. Um, so I, I've been kind of in the paranormal since I was about five. My brother used to uh, torture me and uh, throw me on his motorcycle. He was 17 at the time and he would put me on his motorcycle and we would ride around and go to graveyards and abandoned houses and stuff like that. So um, he would, uh, end up scaring the crap out of me, uh, doing that. And so in turn in, uh, elementary and junior high school, I pretty much did the same thing with my friends. And, uh, when I, uh, when I got out of high school and I went in the military, I was in the army, I was with the rapid deployment unit. So we got to travel all over the place. And whenever I would go places, I would always go and do the weird stuff. I would look for, um, you know, the, the haunted places or the places with legends, big battles, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, in, in, in the 1980s, that really, you know, it wasn't a thing. There wasn't TV shows that talked about this kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I was basically living on the Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and, and those kind of uh, scripted shows, not like today where there's tons of unscripted uh, paranormal stuff. So... I got to do that a lot in the military. And then when I got out, I, uh, I, I uh, for lack of a better term, was a reluctant cop. I became a cop while I was going to, to school. And I just, uh, you know, it's 30 something years later. And I'm like, wow, I'm still a cop. And uh, but during that time, I've learned a lot. You know, I, I worked uh, as a mental health investigator. Uh, that's the guy that does who is suicide mediation, analysis, negotiation, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've been a, a long time a detective and uh, worked in a whole bunch of different units dealing with uh, a lot of um, uh, specialized evidence. So when I decided to start delving off more into the paranormal, that's the um that is the mindset I come from is through my training and experience on uh, evaluating this kind of stuff and researching it. So that's uh, a long way to say that I've written uh, several books on paranormal stuff. And uh, here I am. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, um, you know, one thing, Greg, is that, uh, you know, we've talked about some of your different on the See on the Other Side podcast. We've talked a little bit about um, your different ghost hunting techniques and what you've done when it comes to paranormal investigation uh, in like a live setting. But today right. we want to talk about a new book um, that you've got coming out, uh, Roswell, The After Action Report. And uh, number one, I think you need to explain why it's called The After Action Report. <laughs> and um, number two, Roswell seems to be fairly well-tread ground. And oh, so, yeah. what, so why did you name it the After Action Report? And number two, um, why did you decide that you had something new to say about Roswell that hasn't been said before? Yeah, why in the world <laughs> would I <laughs> do this? Because my wife made me do it. Um, man, I, I so I I have uh, like I said I have that background, also the background in the military, and. Um, For those of you who don't know, uh, you can be in different branches in the military if you like. I I did four years Army, four years Navy. I I did six years Army with my reserve time, four years Navy, and two years Air Force. So um, I have a a wide breadth of understanding of of how military operations are. And and after this book, and after this book, you'll be ready for the Space Force, right? Yeah. Oh, dude, I I would have been all about the Space Force. You (laughs) bet. That's right. They're sending you Um, up here next. Where well, that's the crazy thing is, is so I worked with a lot of guys in the Navy that uh, were involved in Space Command. Uh, Air, Air Force has a thing called Space Command. 
it's right outside of, uh, of NORAD. Uh, and, uh, and that's what they do is they track space debris, um, that's localized, that's close, uh, satellites and any other smaller objects and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I've always been interested in, uh, in sci-fi. I've always been interested in the Apollo programs. Um, a friend of my father's said, uh, uh, you know, I was, I don't know, I was, uh, in fifth grade or something like that. He's like, Hey, Greg, what are you going to do when you grow up? Him and him and my uh, father were sitting there drinking bourbon and I walked through the room and he goes, Hey, Greg, how you doing? You know, Hey, uh, you, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I looked at him, I said, I want to be an astronaut. And my dad said, yeah, but you're going to need to get a job. What are you going to do for money? <laughs> That's what dads like, do. That's what wow. Dad do. Thanks, dad. Let's do this. The day after I graduated high school, my father woke me up at like six o'clock in the morning and threw a one ads on the bed. Yeah. Go get I, a job, boy. He said, school, <laughs> school's over, boy. That's it. That's that, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, greatest generation, man. Go to work. Um, so I've always been interested in, in space. I've always, uh, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Star Trek guy. Um, I, that, I, I've just always been interested in it. So uh, my wife and I used to go to Roswell. She had a friend that lived out there. And, you know, I knew about Roswell from the Unsolved Mysteries episode in like 89 or 90, something like that. And, uh, and I, I watched it then and I was like, man, that's crazy. The, you know, the spaceship crashed out there. I wonder what that's all about. Um, and it wasn't until, uh, you know, in the, uh, 94 or so when the air force, uh, was forced to give an answer, a, a congressman, uh, you know, did a, a formal request. And, uh, so it forced the air force into, to give it an answer. Uh, and the answer they gave was whatever was convenient for them at the time. Um, I, when that report first came out, it came out in like 94 and there was another one in 95. There, there's a couple of different. Uh, dates that are on different reports. Uh, there's one that came out a little bit later and they're all basically saying the same thing. And the interesting thing was when I was looking at it, I was like, man, this is a lot like an internal affairs investigation report where when you get in trouble in law enforcement and you go to internal affairs, um, let's say you, uh, called somebody, a, uh, an inappropriate name of some sort, you know, call them a bastard or something and they complain on you and it, it becomes a internal affairs investigation for conduct unbecoming or unprofessional conduct or something. And, uh, so they'll conduct their investigation and they call you in to do a statement. You go in to do a statement. They say, yeah, well, we've cut, conducted this investigation and they, they slam this, you know, uh, five inch thick, three ring binder that has your name on it, internal affairs, investigation, conduct, unbecoming case number, all this stuff. And it's very, very imposing. It's very, uh, uh, very powerful. You know, it's like, all right, we gotcha. Now, what do you have to say? That's what this reminded me of. You know, the, the air force report is, uh, almost a thousand pages long and 98% of it doesn't have anything to do with Roswell. <laughs> you know, it's just a bunch of gibberish. They, uh, they make copies of copies of copies of old memos and old this, and, and they, they, you know, pulled all this other uh, stuff out of tech manuals. And it's so really in first report. So you think that first report that came out in 1994, the one that, you know, um, it's not, I know that there's two different air force reports that came out, right? There's the original one and then people had reactions to it. And then right. there's like the, the second one they call case closed. And, right. you know, and, and so I think you're trying to say is that when they were putting out these reports, um, it's a thousand pages and that's all, it's almost like it, it's, it's a thousand pages to convince people. Well, uh, you think you're smart. Check out this encyclopedia right here. Right. There's no way that, you know, whatever you say is going to be better than this. Exactly. And, and, uh, that's the crazy part is, is, they're using their authority as officers in the military. They're using their authority as air for being air force, uh, you know, uh, office of special investigations. Uh, they're using this authority and then they throw this huge thing in front of you yet you start go going through it and their transcripts are edited. Now, for, for those of you who don't know, when you do a transcript, a transcript is everything that was said in the conversation from beginning to end. So, uh, I will turn on the tape recorder and say, 
Okay, I, I'm turning on the tape recorder. My name is Greg Lawson. I am in Georgetown, Texas. I'll give an address uh, and, and a name of the building or whatever. I'm here with, uh, you know, uh, Mike Huberty, and we're discussing case number XYZ. Uh, has reference to whatever. Hey, Mike, could you introduce yourself and uh, give your uh, name and date of birth just for the record? And you go through this specific way that you do this. Uh, and then after the transcript is done, oh, you know, and you do the time and date, of course. At the end of it, you say, all right, uh, you know, time and date. Um, you know, I'm turning the recorder off now and click. And when that's transcribed, all of that is in that transcription. They don't edit the transcription. It's, it's crazy uh, the poor quality of the way that they did their transcripts, the poor quality of the way that they did their interviews. Uh, their interviews were just absolutely crazy. Let me let me uh, let me just read one thing just to give you an idea of where they were coming from. Uh, uh, they would say things like this in the interview. They would say, uh, "We're trying." to do, uh, or what we're trying to do is make sure that we're open with the uh, general accounting office. What we're trying to do is make sure that we're open with the general accounting office. Okay. Uh, Yoda said, there is no try. There is only do. <laughs> right. You know, right. And it's like a lot of people will roll their eyes. When I say this, I'm telling you, we make big cases, murder cases based on little bitty things that are subconscious that people say. You know, we'll, we'll, people say, well, how can you tell if somebody's lying if they look up to the right or if they look up to the left or if they're not looking at you or if they're looking at you too much or if they're got their arms crossed or if they're fidgety? No, you don't tell, you, you can't tell if people are, are lying to you about that. You tell whether they're lying based on all of that, their inflection, all of their stuff. Uh, the background, where they're, what they're saying, you know, uh, did you commit the murder? Did I commit the murder? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> Just right. then you, you told me you did because you didn't answer the damn question. You know, did, did you commit the murder? You know, I was raised as a Christian. Yeah. No Christians have ever killed anybody. Huh? Is that what right. you're telling me? Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of different things that you look at and man, for for 15 years, Lynn and I, my wife and I have been going up to Roswell and uh, she visits with her friend and I go to all the, the conference stuff. I sit in the alien abduction seminars. I say, sit in the military mind control seminars and, and all this stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm just sitting there listening. And I've been doing this, like, like I said, for 15 years, not really engaging. Uh, and the stuff that I've learned up there is is pretty amazing. There's, there's a, a whole lot of stuff but I was collecting research this whole time. And I have this, you know, three foot stack of books and papers and, and everything. And I felt like, uh, almost felt like the guy, like in the X-Files, you know, he's in, he's in his mom's basement and he's got all the pictures up on the wall and the locations and the things. And right. The you got a beautiful mind going on in your basement. I got, yeah, I got my, my grandma's yarn and I got, you know, pins and I'm tying it around and connecting all the dots and everything. I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. I do not want to write this book, right? Because if you get off into this, it'll drive you insane, man. The amount of just twisted up stuff and, and the different people. You know, I use this all the time uh, when I'm talking about conducting an investigation. People don't get it. Uh, but there was a murder. Uh, there, there was four murders. This would con be considered a spree murder at a at a yogurt shop in Austin uh, back in the nineties. Um, somebody went in, killed these four girls uh, that were there at the yo yogurt shop, uh, stacked their bodies, uh, and burned the yogurt shop down. And uh, the you know the fire department got there, put the yogurt shop out, and they thought that nobody was in the yogurt shop. And they start sifting through, and they find these four girls, right? Um, in the impending investigation after that, over 40 people came forward and admitted to killing these girls, admitting to that crime. So you're not only trying to figure out what in the world happened uh, based on, uh, you know, testimony, evidence, circumstances, you know, all this stuff, you're trying to put it together. Now you got 40 knuckleheads that are coming in here and trying to take credit for it. What in the world? <laughs> are these people doing? 
you know, and so you have that, uh, you know, all, so many hoaxers that have come forward in the Roswell thing that uh, it makes it oh so hard to actually figure out what's going on because you're you're spending eighty percent of your time uh, basically discrediting people, and a lot of them you can't discredit because there's nothing to discredit other than their testimony. Um, and in 1947, you know, we didn't have GPS. We we didn't have all these cameras everywhere. We didn't have, uh, uh, you know, social media and that, that sort of thing. So it's really hard to track anybody then. So it's really hard to figure out whether they were actually there involved or not. So well, there's what just I like about your book, Greg, you t- talking about that is that you now you go in and you take all the major players involved and then kind of walk through what their role was in Roswell. Um, their different testimony, like you put in a lot of transcripts of direct quotes of things people said, and then you go into like, you analyze it, uh, like you're reading it for looking, like you said before, people answering the questions or people not answering right. the questions, right? Did you commit the murder? Did you, did you touch the alien? Uh, did you, you know, did you touch the alien wreckage? You know, the, 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 the material, the, the, the memory right. metal or whatever. Did I touch the, the memory metal? Well, let me tell you know, it, so, right. so I, I like how you go in. And so for people who haven't maybe, um, are unfamiliar with Roswell, or just kind of know about it. Um, and maybe haven't had a chance to go in depth and, and read a bunch of the books on it. You do like you go into uh, Don Schmidt and his works and you talk about the UFO crash at Roswell. You go into, you talk about crash of Corona um, and the different books associated with it and kind of right. you put in parts of those and you put in parts of the, of the air force report and you put in parts of the actual testimony that people got in affidavits got, they got, and it's kind of neatly, uh, put into character dossiers. I think would that be a fair way to put it for each person? I think so. Yeah. And yeah. So, and so I think for people who are looking for an introduction um, to it, that's kind of like an overview of the material. Um, right. Like a Roswell one hundred and one kind of thing. Yeah, and and it goes in, uh, and it's it's like where we are with the latest of it. So. Right. Um, I thought that was interesting because I learned a bunch. I've, I've read all those books, you know, and but I still learned a whole bunch of things because I hadn't synthesized all all of it together. And so I think it's a really good synthesis of that. Um, well, why did you call and, it the and, after well, action report? Okay, uh, l- let me answer. Oh, okay, uh, for, for what it's worth, it, it, as far as um, just looking at the the individuals. Uh, my uh, particular law enforcement, I, I'm, I'm a current lieutenant for patrol at, at this point, but I've worked in a lot of different areas. Um, we don't have the luxury of having a task force. We do not have the luxury of having, you know, 40 people come into something, go through a bunch of documents, do all this stuff and spend a year conducting an investigation. Um, we are handed you know, investigation after investigation after investigation, you have to manage your investigation. So when you start going down the road that a lot of the Roswell investigators have gone down, which is, um, you know, there's been over 700, probably a thousand people interviewed for, uh, you know, maybe uh, whatever information they might have on Roswell. Well, I I can't do that. Um, I need to know the main players. I need to know the main people that are involved with this and, how this thing was fueled. So uh, that's why I, I boiled it down to what I have there. Um, and in a criminal indictment, when you go before a grand jury, you can't take a, a thousand page report in there. That's ridiculous. You know, you need an affidavit that says this is what happened. And so that's what I was kind of uh, going for in a way. Um, so that leads into why I called it Roswell, the after action report. So because I have 10 years military time and I have 30 something years law enforcement, there's a thing that the military does. And the thing that some law enforcement um, organizations do is called an after action report. And it's, it's um, let's say we're going to conduct some training and we're going to go to a location, uh, uh, 
do certain things at that location, try to accomplish certain objectives, then we're going to go back and we're going to debrief that what we did. Uh, everybody's going to speak on their actions, what they uh, observed. And then uh, the, the debrief is going to be concluded and everybody knows what happened. Well, somebody's going to be assigned to do the after action report on that. So the debriefing uh, identifies what everybody did, what everybody saw, uh, the uh, outcome of whatever happened, uh, and was that the outcome that we wanted? Uh, if not, how would we get that outcome next time and any lessons learned uh, that we might have? So that's what this is. This is more of a and, you know, I, I've already gotten some criticism. The book's been out about three weeks or so, and I've already gotten some criticism on some chat rooms. I was like, this isn't an after action report. I was in the military for 72 years, and that's not how you do an after action report. I'm like, you knucklehead, this is a book called after action report. If I wrote a 13 page after action report, it wouldn't, yeah, it, everybody would go, ah, everybody wants to read this. You're not going to sell so, it on Amazon. Here's, here's <laughs> no, 13 gonna, pages, guys, a buck 30. So, Exactly. Right. Hey, maybe, maybe I could sell a lot of those. Maybe I should do that. Maybe right. I should just do the standard after action report. Just say, I'm sorry. Here's the after action report. You know? Well, uh, as you, as you synthesized all the material and went over the testimonials and the different books and everything and, and your own time of going in, and you talk about that in, in, um, in, in the book, your own dealing, you know, talking to the people who are writing the books and, and going to Roswell right. and the festivals and things. Um, did you find yourself, um, coming in with a certain narrative in your head of what you thought it was going to be, and then came out the other end after you collated and reviewed and did your own stuff? Did you come out with a different idea of what you think happened than when you walked in? Um, so, uh, I guess I did when, when I first went up there, because whenever you're conducting any kind of investigation, immediately in your mind, uh, your your mind creates these um, paradigms uh, through your training, experience, education. Uh, you formulate these models of what is going to happen and how you're going to respond to them. So the model for what uh, this is, it was be most likely this was not a flying saucer with four aliens in it coming from outer space. Uh, you know, just statistic wise, most likely it's not. Uh, right. There's a lot of plane crashes that happened in 1947. Yeah. So this, oh, this, dude, man. I, I don't know if you got to that. was a, a, low, a low chance. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, can you... I, I, I don't know if you really uh, got in depth with that part of the book, uh, but can you believe how many airmen we killed just stateside during World War II uh, in training and uh, and operational stuff in training? It's, it's yeah. as much as who that would killed over Who would want to be a pilot? Oh my god! Rough going against the kamikazes. Try try training. Yeah, yeah. There and and, and so anyway. Um, I, I had an idea of what was going on, but I'm very, very hopeful that, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that we're alone in the universe. I, I believe that there's something out there crawling around somewhere. I don't know whether they can, uh, uh, you know, put a couple of crystals together and send out a radio signal or not, uh, but I'm pretty sure that there's life other places. And I hope that there's uh, intelligent life that, that can do stuff. I think that, that would be amazing. And for them to get here, it would be pretty miraculous, uh, just the distances and time that it would take. So um, I am very hopeful uh, that uh, there are such things. I, I've seen some things when I was in the Navy. I, I was an operations specialist in the Navy, so I operated air detection and tracking and a bunch of other stuff like that, and I, I did – uh, we, we specialize in identify friend or foe uh, aircraft. And so, um, you know, there were things that uh, we would track that didn't have track numbers, were outside of air corridors, were, were behaving uh, strangely. And most of them are, uh, uh, you know, you attribute it to a weather phenomenon and that sort of stuff. But some of it you don't. Some of it you just shrug your shoulders. And go, I don't know what what just happened. Like the the Tic Tac. Uh, so I I served on USS Nimitz, an aircraft carrier, 
and uh, the Tic Tac video that's uh, on, uh, you know, everywhere of the uh, Navy pilots that are following that thing. Um, that that's very interesting. And then that, uh, whatever it was, was tricking those guys pretty good, or it was something that we don't understand, uh, really high, uh, high tech from humans or something really low tech from outer space. I don't know. So, well, you know, but, and you know, talking about, uh, you know, the Tic Tac getting the, the video, that video all of a sudden, uh, gets blown up and then the whole New York times talks about UFOs and things like that. And, um, it, it makes me think about possibly your book where you're talking about the different, you know, officers who are involved and, uh, you know, intelligence officers are involved in the Roswell thing. And so intelligence officers, you know, they could be doing a couple of things. Number one, they could be collecting intelligence, but number two, they could be spreading incorrect intelligence and disinformation that's, and so that's their job you know yeah. as as i'm reading the book and you're talking about these different people involved and what i did not realize and i i think that maybe a lot of people don't realize this about roswell is that um the 609th regiment right that general dubose 509 509 yeah. that general dubose was supervising or in charge of was the at the time was it the only nuclear capable flight uh group or so so the yeah. 509th was actually by uh was commanded by Blanchard and Dubose was uh at Carswell or okay. uh but it, 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 they ended up reporting to him and that's why he's you have that uh um that transfer there and so yeah, they at that time in the United States they were the only nuclear capable um, uh, air wing in the world that could uh, pick up a nuclear bomb and take it someplace and drop it on you. So, in theory, many of the uh, investigators uh, use that uh, as a uh, uh, a point of foundation, a strong foundation, saying, "Hey, these were the best guys in the in the United States." They were the cream of the crop because they were at this place and and this was a big deal. Um, I've been in the military. I've, <laughs> I've seen some guys that handle special weapons, also known as nuclear weapons. Yeah. Now, they, they're just filling that billet, man. There's an open billet there. You know, who are the, the four people that are uh, supposed to transfer out of the unit that they're in and transfer someplace else, and that's where they go. It's right. pretty rare that they go and – uh, like a shop for a special guy. I want these special guys. You know, that's, that's very, very rare. But I was um, thinking, I was thinking, Greg, that th the fact that they were the only nuclear capable uh, group, <laughs> I love it. The, the only, made it so um, secrecy was so important. And so we talk about these different, like, I guess the idea that Roswell could be disinformation, even in the, you know, in the late forties, you know, right. Um, when you talked about the different officers that had go, went to go see, uh, so Mac Brazel comes in, he's like, Hey, there's a, and he's a rancher. Right. And he comes right. in and he's like, Hey, I saw an alien crash, you know, an alien ship or some kind of ship crash fly. And you really go into like flying disc versus flying saucer. Uh, in right. the, the the verbiage uh, that the military uses, the verbiage that Kenneth Arnold, the original, um, the flying the flying saucer guy uses. Yeah, you gotta love the media, man. You gotta right. love the media that he sees. Half, he sees up. like half moons or like crescent shape. Right. He sees flying croissants, and then all of a sudden they turn right. it, they turn it into saucers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the media, uh, you can just, you know, that you can just do a case study on how the, uh, the, the word flying saucer was developed uh, straight from the media. Uh, and then just take that and, and see what happened with all the riots and everything, you know, last year, it's just like, right. wow, you know, they're, they're, they're filling a void, man. They're just filling in their own narrative on stuff. Uh, and you know, a flying disc, you know, uh, recovered a flying disc sounds one way. Captured a flying saucer sounds another way. And right? so why do you think that initial, though, um, when we're talking about the different intelligence officers involved and everything, um, that what I don't understand is you have the initial report, the initial newspaper thing says flying saucer. You even say in the, in the book that um, 
Mac Brazel does three different uh, radio interviews, right? Yeah. You, well, yes. And in, uh, in, and in so a way, right yeah. Two, two different depending on who you're talking to. Okay. Right. The one where he goes to the, like the owner's house or whatever too. Um, but there's, so, uh, so the initial flying saucer report comes out and then like, is it the next day that they're like, no, it's just a weather balloon. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And, that, and let me ask you a question. You yeah. got, you got, all right. So Mac Brazel comes in and he says, Hey, I want to, you know, keep this kind of on the down low. I uh, found some stuff out on my ranch. Um, and, uh, uh, and the sheriff at the time goes, well, it's out of my jurisdiction. Uh, let's, let's talk to the air force. The air force goes out and investigates it. Uh, they come back, they release their press release says they, uh, they recovered, uh, uh, you know, a flying disc, um, which is kind of odd in itself. If it's just a bunch of pieces, wouldn't you say I found we recovered some debris from something from a flying disc or something? Not we recovered a flying disc. And that's that's a huge faux pas, uh, not a faux pas, but that's a huge problem with if Colonel Blanchard, who's in charge of, you know, the only nuclear capable bomb wing in the world, uh, would recklessly just uh, release a press release like that. We recovered a flying disc that implies that it was intact. Right. right. And then the 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 newspaper people go, ah, oh, that doesn't sound cool. Let's say they captured a flying saucer. Yeah, let's do that. And then they put that out there. Um, and then immediately, uh, you know, Ramey and McMullen, they get wind of this thing and they're like, oh, man, we need to do something about this and, and bury it. So, um, you know, they take their action and uh, and the rest is history on that. Well, and that's what, I mean, I think that's interesting is the initial, so the, there's the initial report, then, okay, it's just a weather balloon. And then, you know, 50 years later, then they have the thing where like, okay, it's actually, it wasn't a weather balloon. The weather balloon was a cover up. So like, no matter what, they admitted there was a cover up. Exactly. I think we can all, all agree with that. And the funny thing is, is that uh, when the Air Force investigators were, uh, you know, confronted with that, or they argue, it's not a, you know, oh, this is a, cover. it's just a weather balloon. Well, why didn't you interview, or, or I shouldn't say that because he was passed by then, but why didn't you use the last video of General DeBose at that point saying it was a cover-up, the weather balloon part? You know, and right. the Air Force in their report completely left out DeBose 100%. They have a couple of references that other people made, but why in the world would they completely leave him out? Uh, and what he said, because it was a cover up. The interesting thing is, is so, there's some video you can go on to YouTube uh, and look at some video of uh, the Air Force officials doing their press briefing based on the Roswell report, fact versus fiction in the New Mexico desert. So you, you go on to YouTube and watch these guys. Now, there's a lot of facial expression stuff that goes on with uh, conducting an interview. Uh, and one of the things is, is a gratification smile. Someone will tell you a lie, uh, this big, long, convoluted lie, and they come to the end of it and they will lean back and go, yeah. And they'll it's smile like the, at it. It's like they use car smile. salesmen. Wait, and like they can't help it. They will do it. <laughs> these, these Air Force guys do this in these interviews. It's amazing. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, go to YouTube, type in uh, Bill uh, Clinton denies involvement with Monica Lewinsky and watch the video of where I did not have sex with that woman, Miss right, Lewinsky. Yeah. I did not. But I have to go back to the American people and do, do the American people's work. <laughs> it's amazing. You're just like, wow. You know, and, and, and we can look at things like that now because we know the truth. And we can go back and say, see, I'm telling you, uh, people who are borderline sociopaths can't help themselves. Sure. They will just, it, it just happens. You know, it's a subconscious thing. So, so you know, when, when you go back and uh, looking at, you know, some of the, um, it, it seems like the wilder claims about Roswell, and I, you really point this out in the book well, is... Um, because I remember reading all the things and you talking to uh, uh, researchers like Don Schmidt and Don's a Wisconsin guy. So I've seen him in many things. I think the first time I interviewed Don was 1997 or whatever for the 
the newspaper of the University of Wisconsin um, when he came and did a speech on Roswell for the 50th anniversary. And, um, you know, and, and you see, it's like all of a sudden there's a second crash site. All of a sudden there's, you know, more people say they're involved. And, all of, you know, like the um, there's a uh, there's the, like a guy who says that the army called him up and asked for four small caskets kind of deal. And when you read all about that, I mean, how much of that do you think is that you talking about not necessarily a sociopath because that always has like kind of a you know that's always a negative connotation or murderous connotation or whatever right but but the idea that like how much of that is people kind of wanting to get in on it after the initial like hey there might be something here um how can i get attention for it that's the 40 people looking to claim i mean who in their right mind would want to claim responsibility for murdering four girls like you said before. right Right. So in, in that case, you know, they knew that or they thought that uh, they would admit to that. They would get a lot of, uh, you know, press. Uh, they would go to jail. They'd be in jail. They'd recant. You know, all, all this other stuff would happen um, with Roswell. You got to think, well, there's no downside in any of this, you know, like with the Air Force investigators. OK. They're not indicting anybody. They're not putting anybody in jail. Uh, they're not getting get in trouble for saying it's not a alien. Um, and, and I'm gonna, I'm going to throw something out here. Uh, so you're you're supposed to have the best guys in the world at the 509th bomb wing, right? Because they're the only nuclear capable. That's right. Uh, yet they, you have the Nuremberg trials going on in Germany. You have uh, uh, in in Japan. There's there's trials going on. Uh, 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 you know, for for war crimes, uh, and there is a ton of espionage going on. Would you want to send your best and brightest to do this espionage work and these investigations? Uh, also, so you're you're sending those guys. Over. Where are the guys that just kind of, uh, you know, there there's at Harvard. Did you know that Barack Obama has a degree from Harvard? Right. George Bush has a degree from Harvard. Yeah, same <laughs> same piece of paper. Right. Uh, same school. Two different guys. Yes. So, uh, you know, do you send your best and brightest to do? Uh, an investigation about an obscure UFO incident that happened 40 years prior that, you know, didn't happen, you know, just that's, that's right. Because you're, you're, you're in intuition and you're just gifted that way. And you know, you know, it didn't happen. You roll your eyes and go, God, I'm going to send my two best guys over there and waste, you know, a year of my, a year of their career over there. You know, well, if you, if you, do you think it's advantageous? Of course. Um, you know, of course, in 1994, they're just gonna be like, let's just get this done. Let's just get something out about it. Right. Because the the Showtime movie comes out that year based on Don Schmidt and Kevin Randall's book. Um, and there's so much attention brought to it. Obviously, the X-Files was bringing uh, UFOs back to the main front. You know, like it, it just UF, UFOs were in in the mid 90s. Right. So the Air Force is coming right. out. Now, do you think it's to their advantage at all for people to even if there was no crash? Um, and they can't, let's say, is there any advantage for them to be cagey about it? Either to say like, okay, uh, to, to make it seem like they're covering it up, even if nothing happened. I don't think so. It's all declassed at this point, as far as what they're talking about, the mogul balloon, uh, that's all declassified. So I don't see any reason for that. Uh, but their behavior, see, I, I am not a Roswell expert. Um, Kevin Randall, Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, uh, uh, the late Stan Freeman, uh, and, and many, many others I didn't mention in the book, um, are experts on Roswell. What I am, uh, considered an expert in is investigations. And when I'm lo looking at what they did, the Air Force had a responsibility to conduct a, uh, a competent, above board, honest investigation. In my opinion, they did not. Uh, and to this day, they don't. I mean, you know, uh, so uh, Colonel Weaver wrote a book uh, just last year, 
uh, called back Roswell backstory and some really long subtitle. I don't remember what it is. Um, and the, the book is actually good. I recommend it. Uh, but the interesting thing was, is he said, you know, uh, he, he basically said, you know, it was our responsibility, uh, uh, to go in and, and, and try to make this look like it's a good investigation, no matter how goofy the request was. So from the absolute very beginning, they were like, oh my God, we really are going to do this. No matter, uh, no matter how goofy the request was. No matter how he said that about the congressman, you know, doing a, a open records requ request, basically through Freedom of Information Act. Right. Uh, and, you know, can we find out what's going on in this? And these guys just roll their eyes. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. I, like you said, I, I quoted some stuff there. There's one that I think is is really powerful. Um, uh, he, he, they go into talking about specific things, uh, right in the beginning, they will sit down a witness and just start telling them about the investigation. You don't do that when you have a witness, All right. you sit down and you say, Hey, do you know why I'm here? And they say, whatever they say. Right. And you they're go, leading yeah. With the, they're leading with the thesis statement. So tell yeah, me why, so exactly. tell me why it's like all a, fake. So tell, so it's tell like me why. an abstract, right? <laughs> we have concluded. They sit down with, uh, uh, with uh, Colonel Trukowski uh, and <laughs> we have concluded independently from other researchers and the fact that Mogul is probably responsible for the so-called Roswell incident. The Air Force position is that it was a misidentified balloon. From the very, they sit down and go. <laughs> they tell them what to think right, like, right as it goes. Yeah. And, you know, I've hung out with a lot of military people. Uh, I've hung out with a lot of cops. Uh, very rare do cops get an assignment or do military people get an assignment to go overseas or to travel someplace via air or a long drive away from their family, away from uh, their office and all that stuff. They get there. And they all go, hey, you want to go out to eat tonight? And yeah, let's go out to eat. And they pound bourbon or beer or whatever that night, get up the next morning and go do whatever they're going to do, right? And I'm just wondering whether, you know, there was a, a lot of that going on because the the interviews were were bad. Did they all, they go, were they, did they all go to that poorly. ale inn or whatever in Roswell? They all went to the <laughs> yeah. ale inn the night before? Yeah. They, like, dropped some wild turkey and then just woke up the yeah. next morning. They're like, I don't okay, know what's going on, man. The thing about it is I would not have wanted uh, these Air Force guys assignment to do this because bottom line, if you didn't say you had an air, you know, a spaceship, people were going to berate you about it. Um, but what they could have done is a good investigation, very well documented, professionally interviewed, uh, professionally uh, recorded and wrapped it tight. And it was just so loose and rough and sketchy. I just, yeah. And, and, and let me ask you one other question. Yeah. All right. So here's the deal. You kill your best friend. Thought about it. Yeah, I know. Many times, right? <laughs> I want you, 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 you did. He's dead. I want you to conduct your own investigation and find out who did that. Right. That's the thing with the Air Force. It's like this, the Air Force is the one that, is is committing a conspiracy so we go to the air force and say hey investigate yourself and prove this wasn't a conspiracy or was right. a conspiracy it's ridiculous well why, why they wouldn't recuse themselves and say okay we want to conduct this investigation let's get a guy like uh let, let's get a scientist to come in here uh, a contract or whatever to kind of oversee this investigation. Well, like the Air Force did with Blue Book when they got J. Allen Hynek. They, you know, they get J. Allen Hynek from Hynek. Northwestern University, and they're like, and they figure if he's debunking these UFO cases instead of the military debunking these UFO cases, people will then have more respect for. They'll be like, you right. know what? If 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 all of a sudden this professor, it's if it's a professor debunking instead of the military debunking, then people are are more likely to believe what we have to say. And then all of a sudden you find out that there's a whole bunch of them that you can't debunk. And then he goes off and right. UFOs become something he does for the rest of his life. 
Yeah. And, and so why they didn't think about this is, well, I know why. It's pure arrogance. All you got to do is watch the, the interviews with those guys on YouTube and just go, wow. You know, it, it's like, we're telling you the truth. <laughs> right. Right. The little Prove smile me wrong. comes in. The little smile what are you going to do? Prove me wrong. You know, that we're telling you the truth. Prove me wrong. Well, I, I got to say, after reading a whole bunch of different Roswell books over the past, uh, you know, 25 years, whenever I started getting interested in this in the early 90s, um, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff from reading Roswell, the after action report. And I really liked oh, cool. how it summarized everything and it got in and it synthesized all the previous research. And so um, if you guys are looking out there for an introduction to Roswell, um, that kind of uses a lot of what came before, a lot of the great research, uh, as well as Greg's personal perspective from being a detective and an interrogator. I mean, interrogator sounds like you were taking their fingernails off or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but somebody who this, you know, this our, our counties and cities and states have entrusted to help find the truth in something. Um, I think it's a valuable perspective. And so uh, we'll have a link. Obviously, this is going to be on YouTube. So there'll be a link to pick up a copy of Roswell After Action Report. And it's a great way. It's like all the players. So you can see all the players who are involved. And then um, also, Greg, you do a good job of, you know, the players who seem like the ones who came after the Unsolved Mysteries come and then they, they come in. They're like, oh, my God, my grandma's an alien. You know, they jump in with yeah. that. Um, you differentiate between the original players, the ones who came post Roswell being a thing. Right. Um, and uh, anyway, it, 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 that was real hard for me to, to do that because one, I don't want to concentrate. I don't want to wait uh, as I refer back to the way I have always, and the way local law enforcement conduct, conducts their investigation is a very streamlined uh, case management way of conducting it. We need to talk to the real people, figure out, uh, what the specifics are and move on. And uh, I did not want to waste my time on people that were for sure uh, hoaxers. And then some that, uh, you know, may have had some good information, but then embellished some stuff. Uh, and uh, there was, a, there's a lot of guys that uh, Glenn Dennis, I love his story. I, I love Glenn Dennis's story. I want to believe him. Uh, but uh, after you've told me three or four uh, uh, misstatements, untruths, or whatever you want to call them, um, everything else that you say, I'm going to have it in a notepad over here to the side, but it's not going to be going in probably on the indictment uh, for the simple fact that uh, somebody's going to be able to put you on the on the stand and impeach everything that you said uh, based on just one or two lies. And, you know, you can tell one or two lies in something. Uh, and that doesn't make you a liar. It means that you lied about those particular things because every day we lie about, you know, hey, how you doing? How you been doing? You know, and we just <laughs> randomly say things. Um, so I didn't want to waste a lot of time. And I've had people that I've, I've been on interviews with and they want to talk about, well, why did you say that this guy, you know, you wouldn't consider his uh, his testimony. And I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't waste my time in the book. I, it, we should waste our time now. Let's talk about the guys that really had something to do with this. Well, uh, and I think there's enough there based on the way that the Air Force continued to just gloss over some really specific things. And, you know, it's just fr frustrating. And I like how and I like how you go and you're like, OK, and, and you do you, you analyze some of the transcripts and stuff like that. Like or when somebody starts with something and all of a sudden two years later, their memory gets a lot better. And all of a sudden the story deepens and deepens and deepens from, uh, you know, what could have, you know, it starts, it starts out as something small and then, and you know, it's like they start out as a peripheral character and then they end up as the protagonist. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, and, and you can make sense out of some of that because they're afraid the government's going to come in and do whatever. And, and, you know, they're afraid of repercussions. They don't want to look silly or whatever, but you know, it's interesting when you have somebody that comes into something and they wrap everything real tight with a bow. They have all the locations, all of the, uh, you know, the material, um, all, all the other people that were involved, the bodies, the caskets, the, you know, the, the 
other witnesses to an autopsy and just all kinds of stuff. It's like, man, it's a great story. I love the story. Um, it's, it, right. it's, it's really hard. Right. But, and, and, and for what it's worth, I have stood on the shoulders of great people of Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, uh, Kevin Randall, and all the rest that have been uh, uh, putting this stuff out. Um, 90% of what I talk about is what they've already discovered. I just came in with a uh, forensic statement analysis perspective on um, what was going on with it. Because, I mean, e even interviewers, uh, researchers who have never taken a single interview class, you know, people will go to a, a, a two hour class and go, OK, this is how you interview somebody who, what, when, where, why and how. OK, there you go. Go be a, a detective. Yeah, there's a lot more to it. Uh, there's cognitive interviews, there's regressive interviews, there's interrogation, there's cross-examination. There are tons of different techniques that you use uh, in order to glean information. And when you're not working a criminal case, stepping in and using good cop, bad cop is not the way to do it. Right. Like, you're going to put good cop, bad cop on me? Get out of my house. <laughs> well, you know, I, I tell you, you what, know? Greg, uh, we've got to get going, but I want to say, number one, okay. uh, when I think about the 10,000 hours um, that you, you talk about interrogation and stuff like that. You talk about Malcolm Gladwell yeah. and his 10,000 hours when it takes to be a master or something. Um, you putting your 10,000 hours of interrogation and uh, um, detective work into Roswell, just as much appreciated. And I think you can see that detail uh, and that care and that mastery uh, when you read the book. Thanks, man. So uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I highly recommend it to anybody, especially if you're new to the Roswell game, which you probably aren't, but I, um, but it's a fresh perspective. Um, so you want to check out Roswell, the after action report, and you'll be able to find uh, a link to purchase that book in the notes and also um, a link to Greg's website and more about the paranormal detective. Thanks a lot for your time tonight, Greg. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it.